Life after LIBOR, the birth of new rate benchmarks. Fabio Mercurio, Global Head of Quantitative Analytics, Bloomberg. Fabio es jefe global de análisis cuantitativos en Bloomberg LP, Nueva York. Su equipo es responsable de la investigación y aplicación de los análisis de activos cruzados para la fijación de precios de los derivados, las valuaciones XBA y de riesgos de crédito y gestión de riesgos. Fabio es también profesor adjunto de la Universidad de Nueva York y es un ex miembro del Comité de Riesgos del CME. Es autor de manera conjunta del libro Interest Rate Models, Theory and Practice y de numerosas publicaciones en libros y revistas internacionales, incluyendo 16 artículos de vanguardia en la revista Risk. Fabio es licenciado en matemáticas aplicadas en la Universidad de Padua, Italia, y tiene un doctorado en matemáticas financieras en la Universidad de Erasmus de Rotterdam, Países Bajos. En este keynote speech se discutirá el nacimiento de nuevas tasas de referencia que se supone que reemplazarán a las LIBOR a nivel mundial. Primero, revisaremos las decisiones tomadas por los reguladores y los pasos tomados por el mercado para alejarse del LIBOR y a adoptar los nuevos puntos de referencia. Luego, se discutirá el impacto en los acuerdos heredados y la introducción de alternativas de LIBOR. Finalmente, concluiremos revisando los problemas no resueltos y los esfuerzos en curso en torno a los reemplazos de LIBOR. London Interbanking Offering Rate. La LIBOR ha estado tanto tiempo con nosotros que parecía que iba a estar por siempre. Pero nuevos benchmarks, nuevas tasas de referencia han surgido como resultado de la complejidad de los mercados financieros y la globalización. Las sospechas sobre la determinación de la LIBOR a finales de la década pasada no hicieron sino acelerar este proceso. De las posibles referencias alternativas, la Secured Overnight Finance Rate o SOFR de los Estados Unidos es sin duda la más importante. Simplemente, este mes de octubre se ha cumplido un nuevo hito en el proceso de implementación de este nuevo benchmark. El mercado de derivados más grande del mundo, el CME, ha publicado este mes las reglas de implementación de la transición de LIBOR a SOFR para el mercado de trillones de los swaps. Dichas reglas fueron publicadas como primicia para México y Latinoamérica por Trading and Risk Magazine. Se espera que para finales del 2021 la LIBOR desaparezca por completo. Para ayudarnos a entender la complejidad de esta histórica transición, tenemos un protagonista y experto del tema que está en la primera línea, en la misma trinchera de esta transición en Nueva York, Fabio Mercurio. Fabio, good morning. Great to say hi to you. Great to have you once again with, with us. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Trading uh, Risk Management Trading Conference. You have been with us for already a few years. We'll miss you presentially in Mexico City, but we know you are close to us through technology and um, video conferencing. Our audience is eager to hear from you. What are the challenges and the opportunities for this important and historic transition from LIBOR to new benchmarks in interest rates? Buenos dias. Muchas gracias. Uh, sorry for speaking in English, but you know, it's uh, I could say a few words in Spanish, of course, because I'm Italian. I can understand Spanish, I think. Okay. But you know, if you don't mind, it's better for me also to give this talk in English, also because there are lots of English terms. My slides are in English uh, anyway, so um, uh, it's going to be easier, at least for me. I, I hope it's going to be uh, okay for you guys if you know this talk is in English and not in Spanish, but. Um, uh, I'll be speaking slowly, and uh, I, you know, I hope I'll be, uh, be able to communicate clearly for um, you know for everyone. So um, um, the purpose today is really to give you an overview of the things that are happening in the market because of live transition. So this has been a major thing in the market for the last few years, and uh, given that the deadlines are approaching. Everybody in the market is getting more and more anxious to know what's happening and what kind of action. 
And um, so whenever you're ready, you can put on the slides. I can, I can talk also without the slides. So if people are happy to, <laughs> to listen to me. But um, I'm just going to give a, like, a quick overview. So essentially, um, a lot of things are happening in the market. And starting from uh, the U.S., then, you know, of course, uh, what happened in the U.S. Uh, also had ramifications in other regions as well, in Europe, in the U.K., in Asia, and uh, also now in the emerging markets. So the, um, uh, the bottom line is that um, um, we saw that uh, IBOR, that, you know, it's um, the main reference index for millions of financial contracts globally, um, uh, you know, started to be manipulated during the financial crisis. So there is enough evidence um, back uh, in 2009, 2010, that this major index was actually rigged by financial institutions for a number of reasons. We don't see um, why. So, um, of course, this was not really ideal because that index is used not only in transactions between banks, but also in, uh, um, you know, in many other activities. And uh, that's why regulators decided to step in and to say that the LIBOR is not sustainable and we need to replace it with something more robust. And uh, uh, when I say this is uh, uh, something important for the whole um, uh, world, for all the people, all the taxpayers, not only um, you know, the financial markets and uh, you know, financial institutions, um, what I mean is that every, anybody who went to a bank asking for a mortgage, if the mortgage is actually uh, based on the floating rate, that floating rate is likely to be uh, some eyeball. And I own myself a mortgage here in the US. It is an adjustable rate mortgage. I pay a low interest rate at the beginning. And after a few years, that uh, fixed rate is converted into one year LIBOR plus a fixed spread. So even I, you know, as a normal citizen, not just, you know, a, um, a person working in the financial community, but just as a normal citizen taxpayer, I have a contract, I sign a contract uh, that is based on, um, on some uh, LIBOR. So um, uh, regulators, as I said, stepped in and said, okay, uh, we know that this index is great, is the uh, underlying rate for millions of contracts, not only derivatives, but also uh, cash instruments like mortgages, loans, and uh, um, uh, float rate notes. So things that are also more common and more accessible to normal people. And uh, so we need to do something about it. This, this index is not sustainable, uh, doesn't comply, comply with uh, uh, a bunch of principles that this international organization called IOSCO put together. So effectively, um, uh, the, um, this index um, uh, cannot be used as main reference rate in transactions anymore because it is not representative of, of the actual, um, say, um, um, borrowing um, power of the bank industry in the market. So, uh, also, okay, I saw that, uh, you know, my first slide is uh, uh, up there. So maybe we can uh, start and uh, start with um, uh, the very first slide with this one, thank you. So um, uh, uh, basically already kind of said um, uh, anything that is written in this slide. So we know that IBORs globally, not only USD LIBOR, could be Euro IBOR in the Eurozone, could, could be um, uh, UK LIBOR and so on, are the reference rates for millions, millions, literally millions of financial contracts. And uh, uh, this rate has been key in defining a lot of transactions uh, because uh, a lot of people, as I said, including common people like myself, uh, can have exposure to this rate because we need contracts like, such as mortgages, but are loans or so on, or even bonds um, that uh, are based on this rate and offer exposure to this rate. What, what happened? What happened is the following, that uh, the um, uh, unsecured term lending market 
in, uh, say, uh, in the very recent years, but even before, say, after financial crisis 2008-9, hasn't been very active. So um, the main problem with LIBOR is that it is not based on actual transactions, or it is mildly based on actual transactions, because there are not really many. So whenever a bank contributes their own offer rate, it's mostly based on their perception of their, um, uh, say, uh, borrowing power. It's not based on an actual transaction, necessarily. So uh, that, that's why uh, those contributions were effectively manipulated by banks. So banks were manipulating numbers that were not the actual ones. So um, this was kind of known uh, for people being in the, uh, in the financial community, but it's only after a few years when uh, there were specific cases with the, which I will mention uh, later on uh, that regulators decided to step in uh, you know, and make sure that uh, we were doing something more robust. Why? Because effectively they realized that the LIBOR is a great index, but it is not IOSCO compliant meaning that it doesn't, um, it doesn't satisfy all the good principles that IOSCO put together for a robust index to be sustainable. And effectively, LIBOR and in general IBORs don't satisfy almost any of them. So that's why we had to come up with some replacements. So, um, why is LIBOR coming to an end? So I will explain why. So essentially the main reason is LIBOR manipulation that trigger everything, but essentially it's because it is not a sustainable business index, sorry. And given that uh, it is a reference rate for millions of financial contracts, and given that the outstanding notional of uh, contracts based on this index is in the hundreds of trillions of US dollars, we are talking about like a huge market, we cannot afford as a financial system to continue to use an index that is not as objective as it should be. So um, the main communication that was made by some regulator was actually the one by Andrew Bailey in 2017, uh, that basically said that LIBOR is not sustainable and that will be phased out in 2021. So we don't have clear deadlines yet, but um, after that communication from Andrew Bailey, markets globally made steps in the direction of phasing out eyeballs. So um, if you ask, do we have a deadline yet? We don't, but extremely likely, very likely, LIBOR will no longer exist after December 31st of next year. So as a consequence of, um, uh, of the committees that were formed in different regions globally and uh, um, new benchmark rates, new benchmark risk free rates, I will use the acronym RFR for risk free rate. So new risk free rates have been selected in major economies globally. Uh, I put there five, but actually there are more, right? So it's, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I should have updated my slide, but in fact, there are more and more, say, economies that uh, identified a new replacement for, um, uh, for LIBOR. So one thing I'm going to say um, uh, before uh, moving to the uh, agenda of this uh, presentation is that uh, given that this is um, uh, a plenary um, uh, talk, I, um, I want to be very high level and I hope you appreciate the effort because I'm a quant and as a quant I really want to show formulas but I think okay there is no need to show formulas today I really want to give you a very high level message and I hope you appreciate that but of course if you have any technical question I'd be more than happy to, to try to answer those because that's also my, my background. So for today, given it's also plenary, given that there is a lot of information to be communicated and digested, I'd be only very, very high level. Uh, so next slide, please. So the agenda of today's talk is, uh, is the following. So essentially, I'm gonna divide the presentation into two parts. So the first part is very, say, destructive. So I, uh, I will uh, basically, 
um, uh, uh, communicate uh, facts from the market, not opinions, mostly facts. So the first part is related to facts, what really happened and what the market, what kind of actions the market already took in the direction of LIBOR replacement. The second one, the second presentation, or the second part of the presentation, will be um, uh, more on other facts regarding uh, the fallback of LIBOR. So essentially the way we deal with existing contracts, but it will also contain a lot of opinions from it. So, so we'll also uh, tell you what needs to be addressed and what can be done, what kind of steps the market is taking. But okay, so it's not about decisions made yet. It's more about issues that we need to look, at, look into and, uh, and be careful about. So, um, um, okay, this is a bit, a bit of agenda, so, but effectively I can tell you that um, uh, there are uh, four, at least four steps that uh, a country, a region, say um, uh, a region where a given currency is being used has to take, is which are the following. So the moment you decide that the IBOR in that region is not sustainable and need to be replaced, then you need to come up with uh, a replacement. And this replacement is a, a new um, uh, risk-free rate benchmark. So that's the first step. The second step is um, the creation of the derivatives market associated with uh, uh, the benchmark. Because you know you want to migrate away from uh, from an existing benchmark, and there is a lot of market. I mean, huge market. We said the millions of derivatives, right? And the standing notion is a uh, uh, hundred trillions of US dollars. So you also want to migrate not only from IBOR but also from the market that is based on IBOR. How do you do that? You do that by creating a parallel market based on a new rate, and uh, we see all the steps there. Another step is about definition of fallbacks. Why? Because you need to tell people what they have to do with existing contracts. So I told you about my mortgage. I have this mortgage that is referencing LIBOR. What happens to my mortgage when LIBOR disappears? So um, there is a clause, of course, in my contract there is some fallback language, but that fallback is not sustainable. The usual fallbacks written in existing financial contracts were supposed to take care of temporary um, absence of, of um, quotes. So today, LIBOR hasn't been uh, uh, submitted for some reason. So I you know, fine, okay, the calculation agent comes, comes up with the valuation. So essentially contacted directly a few banks and so on. This is something that can be done maybe for one day, two days or so on, but cannot be done on a regular basis, cannot be done you know, in a sustainable manner. That's why we need to have more robust fallbacks than the one currently in financial contracts. So that's another uh, thread, another step that the, the industry is taking. So another step, if you want, is about the creation of risky indices because all the new benchmarks are like software are risk-free. Why? Because they're more liquid. Usually the highest liquidity is on overnight rates. And overnight rates can be considered as risk-free as it, as it gets. And uh, uh, not only because some transactions like for software are collateralized, so you have even a guarantee, uh, guarantee of a, of a bond, but also because, uh, you know, overnight people essentially decide to uh, lend money to the kind of party only if they know that the kind of party has no issue, right? So whenever there is an issue with the kind of party, like in the Lehman's case, they usually don't lend money, not even overnight. So in a sense, um, uh, we can think that really um, any overnight rate is a very good proxy for um, a risk-free rate. And all the new rate benchmarks that have been selected globally are in fact overnight rates. There are some caveats, we'll analyze uh, them uh, as well, because of course, I mean, there is not a fair comparison when you go from a LIBOR, which is typically a three-month or six-month index, 
to an overnight rate, which is a one-day index, right? So you want to make a comparison. You want to try uh, to transact, to, to transition, sorry, from one uh, period to an equivalent period. We're going to see how we can do that. And, but um, the point I want to, to make is that so the, um, the new benchmarks like uh, uh, software are overnight, overnight rates. What about, what about risky rates? Some people in the market may want to have exposure to risky rates because they want to have a rate that uh, goes up in case of a financial crisis, like LIBOR does. When there is a financial crisis, like the recent COVID crisis, LIBOR went up. Software didn't go up, stayed there. So some people may really want to have a rate that goes up when there is a crisis. So that's why the market is also um, uh, coming up with uh, actual LIBOR replacements that are closer to LIBOR. And this is yet another step that the market has to make. On top of that, uh, all market participants, all financial institutions, but also all corporations or so anybody who has an interest in LIBOR and uh, has to keep a close uh, attention to what's happening. Because we need to take actions to make sure that we comply with the current markets, current regulation, and we take the necessary steps to make sure that we are ready to migrate away from LIBOR when LIBOR will be uh, discontinued. So uh, that's more, more or less the plan for today. So we can start with, uh, uh, with the first uh, um, uh, part of the talk. So next slide, please. Next. So um, I'm sure a lot of you um, uh, know a lot about the LIBOR scandal, what happened in, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in the last uh, 12 years after 2008 and so on, right? Actually, um, you know, just to, um, uh, to set the history correctly, um, is everything started in, not in 2008, as some people may uh, remember, but in fact in 2007. So the, the very first crisis was in fact um, a, a liquidity crisis. So we had a liquidity crunch that uh, came after the mortgage subprime crisis. So in uh, um, August 2007, uh, so what we saw, we saw that suddenly uh, LIBOR went up and uh, uh, you know, OIS based on the Fed fund rate stayed there actually started going down. So the basis that was uh, fairly constant and tiny uh, you know, until the previous day uh, started becoming you know, very wide. So there was an effect in the market. So um, people started realizing LIBOR was not risk-free anymore. So that was the first uh, um, uh, signal that something was happening in the market. And, uh, um, and uh, as I said, there was a liquidity crunch. So people were not really lending money so freely to other, uh, other institutions because they were afraid they had a lot of toxic instruments. And uh, uh, since they were afraid they had a lot of toxic instruments, they said, okay, you know, why should I lend money to this other bank over the next uh, six months? Because I don't really know if they go bust, they go bankrupt within six months. I don't have enough information. Maybe they're hiding a lot of information. Maybe they have so many toxic credit derivatives that they're not disclosing. So uh, how can I trust them? So I rather not uh, give them money. At the same time, at the same time, they were saying like, look, I don't know. I, I, I cannot trust my own um, uh, books and portfolios either, right? So uh, because maybe they, they also, uh, you know, had some, some uh, toxic derivative and uh, which they didn't know uh, how to value properly. So it's better to keep the money, if you have it, to meet our obligations and liabilities instead of giving money around and facing the risk of not having the money to pay our obligations in the future when it is needed. So um, liquidity crunch, and there was a concern in the market that people had, you know, people, namely bank, banks, had a lot of toxic um, um, derivatives. And uh, um, so I would say 2008, 
uh, banks started already submitting, uh, even before, maybe even 2007, submitting uh, LIBOR contributions that were actually lower than they should have been. Why? Because, uh, in a sense, essentially, they wanted to pretend they had a better credit quality. So if I say, look, uh, let's say that the OIS rate, um, uh, so the Fed fund base rate is a 2%. If I say that suddenly uh, my uh, borrowing rate is, uh, is 4%, I'm giving a, a, a bad sign to the market. I want to say, oh, you know, my borrowing rate is 2.5 because there is a risk premium, of course, but it's tiny because don't worry, I'm, uh, um, I'm healthy enough. Don't worry about my credit worthiness. Everything's good. Uh, I'm trustworthy. You can still give me money. There is no problem with that because my library is, uh, you know, uh, is only a bit higher than uh, the OES rate. So this, this is a common practice and uh, there is evidence of that. The banks were doing that. So they were contributing LIBORs that were lower, even like 50 basis points lower than their actual um, offer rate in the market. So if they had to, um, you know, um, issue commercial paper, the rate would have been like a 3%, not 25 these kind of things. Uh, but uh, it's only later in the following years when we found evidence on specific emails that traders sent between, you know, different, uh, between each other inside the same organization. And that it was clear that banks were rigging LIBOR. So, and this evidence was actually about uh, a LIBOR manipulation of as low as one basis point, two basis points. Why? Because if you are a swap trader, even one basis point of difference can mean a lot of money for you. The, uh, the swap market usually was quoting within like a, a one eight, or, you know, a couple of eight of basis points. So one basis point of difference or even two basis points is really a, a, a huge difference. And given the notion of Satar being um, uh, exchanged. So, um, so people went to jail, and actually, one one trader in uh, Europe uh, just came out. I mean, I think uh, last month or something. So, so they went to jail, but that was real, and uh, uh, evidence was real. People went to jail, and uh, so it was it was not a joke. And, uh, um, and the reason why, um, also, uh, of course, at the end, regulators decided to step in is because this was not just a business between uh, a bank and another bank, right? But there was also taxpayers' money involved, and uh, um, uh, there is plenty of information on the web. So I'm not I'm not disclosing any uh, any private information or any any uh, you know uh, secret here. But you know I can suggest uh, whoever is interested to uh, read uh, the Wikipedia page called Libor Scandal. It's very informative. There is a lot of information. Again, everything is public, uh, and, but you know the main uh, the main reason why um, uh, regulators, at least in the US, decided to step in is because of, because of municipalities, and municipalities were issuing uh, um, uh, floating rate bonds and were hedging them with uh, um, uh, LIBOR based ones. So they were issuing uh, a floating rate uh, bond based on a muni rate, and they were receiving from a bank LIBOR to hedge the muni rate they were paying to um, the investors. So you can imagine now, if you're receiving LIBOR, a LIBOR is, is rigged downwards, so it is being uh, um, uh, set at a lower value than it should be, you are losing money because the muni rate does not change. The muni rate is still maybe 3%. Now you are receiving a 2 point, uh, uh, say 98 instead of 3. So it's only two basis points, but again, you need to multiply by huge notionals. And that difference, you know, can amount to millions of dollars at the end. And this is taxpayers' money. So that's why, um, that's a concrete example of why this is not just uh, an issue between different banks, right? It's not that the bank stole money from another bank. It's really that banks effectively um, um, impacted uh, also the finances of um, of normal citizens. So anyway, so there is a uh, um, uh, there is plenty of information. Of course, uh, we can argue also to be on the bank side. We can argue that also when you know, I, I, I'm a, as a mortgage owner, 
if banks are uh, contributing LIBOR that are lower, uh, that's also good for, um, uh, for taxpayers because effectively we're going to pay a lower interest rate than we should be paying. So, but, you know, um, but that, that's the way it is. I'm just stating facts, not, I'm not giving opinion on this, right? So you can read, uh, you know, um, as much as you want on uh, this LIBOR scandal page of Wikipedia. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to be very quick on this one. So essentially, because of this evidence of land manipulation, so in the US, but also in other regions, um, the regulators decided to, to set up uh, committees. Uh, committees were formed essentially by uh, market participants, so by regulators, uh, traders in banks, or risk managers, even academic uh, people. So people with different backgrounds, but also like, you know, some vetted interest in, uh, in, uh, you know, in this. And uh, so the purpose was actually to uh, come up with a LIBOR replacement to say, okay, what's the best index, best new interest rate benchmark that we can use as a LIBOR replacement? And uh, um, so uh, they, uh, the purpose of these committees was also to identify best practices and also identify a plan to, uh, to uh, make sure that the okay, transition was, uh, was happening. So, um, uh, so this is happening in the U.S., but as I said, the um, um, reference rate committees um, um, were set in other regions as well. Next slide, please. So um, one important date uh, is that uh, is uh, June 22nd, uh, 2017, so more than three years ago. So the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, this is a committee in the U.S., uh, made an announcement, and they said that, you know, after almost three years, of uh, work, they came up uh, with a solution. So they said, okay, you know, they, they consider different alternatives, you know, and uh, so what's the best rate to replace LIBOR? And they basically said the best rate to replace LIBOR is uh, what we call secured overnight financing rate. So that's what, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, software. So um, uh, software is an acronym for secured overnight financing rate. And the software is effectively an overnight uh, repo rate. I'm going to see the actual definition in a moment in the next slide. But for now, um, so what we uh, need to say is that, okay, there was this announcement. So I say essentially, they're saying, okay, you know, after um, years of uh, discussions, decisions, and, uh, and so on, we decided that this is the best, uh, this is the best replacement. So it's an overnight rate. It's a repo rate. And... Uh, um, um, that, that was great because that was, you know, the very first announcement. And after that, um, uh, new uh, benchmarks, new risk-free rate benchmarks were selected in other economies. So, uh, as I said, in the U.S. we have software. In the U.K. we have Reform Sonia. Um, so that was, in a sense, easier uh, because basically they, they already had some, uh, some robust overnight rate. They just had to, to amend it a bit. So essentially to... Um, uh, extend the range of contributions, so including like uh, you know more transactions, and also change uh, changing a little bit the calculation uh, methodology. <clears throat> Same for Switzerland, Japan, and the eurozone. So uh, the eurozone is actually the uh, maybe the, the most interesting case because um, uh, usually uh, European people like myself tend to complicate matters because. Uh, for some reason, we rely like complications as opposed to Americans that are very, very pragmatic. But this time, I think it happened actually the opposite. So, um, uh, so the eurozone came up with this uh, uh, ester that is a replacement for uh, um, Ionia, and this uh, the uh, the euro um, overnight rate. And uh, uh, so the, the reason why you say that this time um, uh, Europeans came up with something simpler is because there is a very easy connection between Ionia and Esther. So essentially, the, you know, uh, Esther is Ionia plus 8.5 base points. So it's really an easy conversion. And this actually uh, allows us to do a lot of good things, a lot of simple things. So for example, when it comes to uh, calculating curves and, or, you know, even um, um, having some historical curve that can be used for uh, risk management purposes. So when it comes to uh, other uh, other um, benchmarks, uh, the situation is more, more difficult because, for example, we don't have a history of uh, the, those reference rates. But if you have an easy transformation like the one in the Eurozone, you can, you can build up uh, more things more easily. So next slide, please. So on... Uh, um, 
software. Um, so on uh, each business day uh, started on April 3rd, 2018. Uh, so the New York Fed has been publishing a software, the Secure Over Funding Rate. So this rate um, so is calculated as a volume weighted median. So that, that's important. These are important words. So it's a, it's a median. It's not a mean. It is a major difference between a, a median and a mean. Um, uh, so um, it's... Uh, okay, let, let, me, let me just make a simple example for everybody's consumption without like uh, putting myself. Okay, so if you... Um, uh, um, for example, if you have uh, three points and you have a one, one, three... The median is one despite the three, but if you take you take uh, uh, the average, that three as a uh, as a very important uh, meaning. Actually, let's do one one four. That's easier. One one four. The median is one because the uh, the central point is one, but the uh, the average is going to be two because the average takes into account outliers essentially. So you're using the median uh, when you don't want to. Um, uh, when you want to remove outliers and you use the average when you want to account for outliers. So there is like a big outlier, so a big crazy number. If you don't want that to be, to screw up your, um, your calculation, then use a median. And of course it needs to be uh, volume based because you don't want tiny volumes to be, uh, um, you know, so, so important, right? So, um, uh, you say, for example, you have a lot of transactions, a very, very small volume at some level, and a big transaction at a different level. You want that big transaction to have a much more weight than the small transactions. As simple as that, right? So nothing really fancy. So, um, uh, so basically, uh, uh, software is uh, this volume weighted median of what? Of repo transactions. So there, it's overnight repo transactions. Repo transaction essentially an overnight an overnight loan, uh, so one day loan that is collateralized by um, a treasury bond. So uh, you give bond to a party, a party gives you gives you money, you pay back to you know next day with the interest and so on, and you, you 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 get back the bond. So as simple as that. And uh, the transactions could be bilateral, directly between two counterparties, or trilateral with some um, say clearing house in the middle, and or center center counterparty in the middle. So uh, you can get all this information on the New York website. So I'm, I'm here just summarizing everything high level for, uh, for your convenience. So next slide, please. So this is, this is a quick graph showing you the evolution of software compared to, uh, to the Fed fund. And you see the two rates that really track each other. The main difference between software and Fed fund is that, okay, Fed fund is, uh, yeah, um, is uh, more... Um, um, and now I don't, let me, let me check because I uh, also uh, don't see the color very well. So the, uh, uh, so software is white, the Fed fund is, uh, is yellow. So, um, so um, software is the one that spiked and the Fed fund is the one that stayed the same. So what happens is, um, um, so you have that the Fed fund is more piecewise constant. Let me see whether it goes up. Uh, stays there, goes down, stays there, and so on. But software instead um, is more hectic. It's a more like you know uh, uh, nervous behavior, like a like a stop. But uh, the uh, the main level is the same. The main level is the same. There, there were these spikes typically end of month, end of quarter, end of year, and uh, and there was also this major spike in September due to um, um, corporate taxes. But uh, um, those spikes essentially uh, disappeared in the recent months. So we don't see uh, the, those spikes anymore. And now, I mean, both rates are close to zero, so they, they are effectively very, very similar. But the main difference is that software still, you know, is more uh, volatile than, uh, than the Fed fund. Fed fund has to be more, uh, more stable over time. And uh, um, next slide, please. So um, once we... Um, uh, we have now a new benchmark, as I said. Uh, the second step is for the market to start uh, a market for derivatives. And this is exactly what happened, right? So April, first publication of uh, software, May, CME um, launched uh, futures based on software. So there are two types of futures, one-month futures and three-month futures. One-month futures are different because they pay the arithmetic average of software. So you have a one-month time period 
In this time, basically what you do, you take the daily observation of software and you take the arithmetic averages. You use some, all these observations, you divide by the number of observations. As simple as that. And you pay this number at the end of the month. How many months you have? you have 13 um, uh, calendar months. So effectively, one month futures go from today up to a bit more than a year. Um, next slide, please. Then we have also three month uh, software futures. Three month software futures uh, span a wider interval, five years, but they are called, they are quoted quarterly. So there are only five major maturities, the typical ones, so March, June, September, December, and for every year. And you have 39 consecutive quarters with uh, uh, listed futures. So as I said, spanning like a five-year period. Every single future pays something different. They, instead of paying the uh, arithmetic average, they pay some kind of compounded average, this, kind, this rate in arrears. What you do on a daily basis, you take software, you compound it, uh, you know, geometrically, not arithmetically, geometrically with a previous uh, level, and, and so on. You do that until the end of the period, and you pay this uh, rate at the end. So um, this is the rate that is actually the uh, um, uh, being at the, uh, if you like, the the, the benchmark in uh, um, in many. Uh, transactions these days, not only futures and mass futures, but also swaps, as we'll see, as we'll see in a moment. Um, I don't know if you guys keep seeing myself. Yes, I'm back. That's good. Uh, I don't know if it's good, but okay, I'm back. It's uh, 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 next slide, please. So the um, okay, so the futures were the first derivative, right? That have been proposed by the market. Uh, but then um, what we have that uh, SCH starting clearing the first swaps, right? So because the, after futures, you have swaps. And the first swap was a, a, a software Fed fund based swap. So essentially the, the swap, for, you know, with base swap where you exchange Fed fund for, for software and, uh, and followed by um, uh, a software swap and another Fed fund software swap. That was a SCH. And uh, CME uh, did the first swaps in, in October two years ago. Um, and then after that, you know, they've been clearing uh, swaps and swaps more regularly. Uh, even though the liquidity, unfortunately, is, is not there yet. I can, I can expand on that later, but, you know, um, it's important to know that there is already a swap market in place. It has been cleared by CME and STH, but, you know, um, we are still uh, struggling to get the desired liquidity and uh, it is not uh, equivalent to the liquidity in the um, uh, library-based market, unfortunately. What about options? Um, uh, beginning of this year, CME launched options on uh, three months of software futures. This was important, I mean, because they, they give you an indication of the volatility for, for software-based instruments. And, uh, uh, but we know that the main indication comes from the swap option market. And in fact, the swap option market has some kind of, uh, uh, um, First uh, indication in uh, February when uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan executed two software swaps with the US clients. So, the, um, uh, so basically, you see these are the steps, uh, not really quick actually, that the market and the industry is taking towards the creation of a new derivatives market. And, uh, um, you know, it's really fundamental to, to get more liquid swaps. Uh, in place before end of next year, if you really want to be able to build a liquid software curve. Because you know, uh, yield curves are built by using the futures in the short end and swaps in the mid to long term ends, right? So you really need the uh, transactions also for longer maturities and are liquid ones to build a liquid, a liquid reliable curve. And you need also volatility data to be able to, um, you know, build your volatility cubes. Why? Because anytime you need to, um, to price some optionality based on the rate, you need to calibrate your interested model to the underlying market. So you need a market for, for that. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned also cash instruments, not only derivatives. And, uh, and in fact, um, after derivatives uh, were uh, issued, 
and uh, started to be cleared and traded, um, also the fertility note market became uh, more active. And uh, the very first transaction was by Fannie Mae um, in uh, 2018. So Fannie Mae um, basically issued the first floating rate note, and that was followed by the World Bank that also issued the floating rate note, the Credit Suisse um, the commercial um, deposit, and uh, uh, certificate of deposit, sorry. And the Barclays that they issued the commercial paper, then MetLife and the floating rate notes and, and other, and other institutions. So the, the interesting thing is that, okay, some of these uh, uh, notes were actually callable. So in a sense, we right two years ago, people were issuing notes that were already callable. So a callable note contains a swap option, embeds a swap option, right? So there was already a need for a, a swap option to hedge uh, your callable float rate node based on software. So, but maybe um, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the swap option was really so far out of the money that people really didn't bother maybe hedging it. But if rates go really uh, up, uh, doesn't seem to be like very likely now, but if they really go up up to the roof, then okay, you know, the, these swap options could really be uh, worth something. Next slide, please. So um, it's also important to understand what's happening in the clearing houses. So, uh, so you have a new rate benchmark, and you need to you know, and you need to use uh, also um, uh, um, a collateral rate uh, to pay your margin accounts. And uh, um, so, what happens is that SCH and uh, CME uh, decided to use different approaches, right? So, uh, the two main clearing houses decided something different. So, SCH decided to use the Fed fund. They kept using the Fed fund also for software derivatives. Um, and instead, uh, CME decided to use a software uh, right away for uh, software derivatives. So, but bottom line is that um, last week, uh, both of them switched to software for uh, pricing everything. So there was a major big bank, so called big, big bank. So basically, they went from using Fed funds across the board to using software across the board. What does it mean? Um, CME, for example, started using software for software-based derivative. But what about a library-based swap, a fixed for floating library-based swap? That was still discounted. That was still discounted using Fed funds. So starting last week, the two main clearing houses decided to migrate to software discounting. So every single transaction is being discounted using um, uh, software. Why am I uh, saying discounting given that software is used as a collateral rate? So there is a fundamental connection that is uh, proved mathematically and actually was uh, you know, uh, uh, formally uh, justified in uh, uh, two important papers. Um, the, um, the very first one is less known, the second one is more known. So the very first one was by uh, three Japanese guys, uh, Fuji, Shimada, Takahashi, and the most famous one is by Vladimir Peterberg, and that because there's a publication in magazine. So, and he, he won the quantum of the year um, uh, Risk Magazine Award in 2010 for this. So, the, um, so what happens basically, they both came up with a, a modeling framework that tells you that if your collateral, you have, if you have a collateral rate, the collateral rate is the right rate you need to use for discounting purposes. So if you have um, a collateralized transaction, uh, assuming no um, counterparty uh, credit risk, so there is no default counterparties, but you have like a full collateralization, so you post collateral on a daily basis with your counterparty and so on, and for the full um, um, uh, amount of your um, uh, portfolio or your net set, then the proper discount rate to use for uh, MPV purposes is the collateral rate. That's why there is a, a clear connection between a collateral rate or price alignment interest, which is a collateral rate that is paid by clearinghouse, and the discount um, rate, the, the rate using for discounting cash flows. The two rates, because of uh, this theory that we all agree on, are effectively the same rate. So. Um, 
So this is this is uh, important to uh, to say. So now there is a full agreement between CME and uh, and LCH on the uh, collateral rate to use. So on the discount rate to use to calculate the MPV of um, uh, of, uh, of transactions. Um, uh, forward curves could be slightly different because also you have different fees between like different uh, clearing houses. But that's a different story. So it's important to say that now uh, more and more there is more and more adoption of software. I'm just focusing on software, but the same thing applies to other benchmark rates because even clearing houses are adopting software instead of Fed fund where Fed fund was used before. So now uh, software is becoming the main um, the main um, collateral rate for collateralized transactions and actually for clear transactions, and so it becomes the, the right rate to use for discounting purposes. Next slide, please. In this slide, maybe uh, I'm not sure how clear it is. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot see it very well myself. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not gonna. Um, uh, I'd be happy to um, uh, to distribute the slides, and, and they are available, so you can check the numbers. But essentially, what you are doing here, we we did an impact study. So, what's going to happen to your swap while you uh, um, switch from so um, sorry from Fed fund to software? So you are this, first you are discounting uh, cash flows using the Fed fund curve. Now you're discounting cash flows using the software curve. So you are changing the discount factors. This of course has an impact. So what we found in our simple analysis is that the impact is not really um, dramatic also because of the, uh, the two rates are very, very close to each other. And so the impact is, uh, um, uh, is, is not so much. It's bigger on uh, on euro because, as I told you, uh, the difference between Esther and uh, Ionia is uh, eight basis points. So it's uh, effectively bigger and uh, more constant along the curve than than um, the difference between software and uh, Fed fund. Uh, but um, uh, I would say that you know um, these things can easily be calculated, and uh, the impact uh, was higher on on the euro and higher also on the forward start. Um, uh, swaps, not surprisingly, because for four-star swaps, the, um, uh, the assumptions that you are making on the valuations, on the way you value deals on discounting, and you discount them is actually uh, more important, has a higher impact. So this more or less concludes our, our um, the first part. So I'm happy to, to switch to the second part. Next slide, please. And let me know if there is any question on, on this part so far. I'm going to uh, drink a little bit. So if there is any question, feel free to ask me. If not, we, we move to the, to the next part and we keep uh, the questions for later. So, um, OK, the second part maybe uh, uh, could be more interesting because, again, there are less facts. So I wanted to give you an overview of the facts. This is more like a, a, a based on uh, my own uh, opinions, if you want. And uh, there are some facts as well, but also like, you know, um, uh, my opinion is what could be done and what the next steps are and so on, right? Um, so um, I mentioned before that the new risk-free rates are overnight rates. And this mitigates a problem because if you have a LIBOR that is three-month based or six-month based, how can you replace it with an overnight rate? That's not a fair comparison. It's not a fair comparison. So it is not a fair comparison, in fact, for two reasons. The first reason is because LIBOR spends a longer time, so three months versus one day. The second reason why the comparison is not fair, it is because uh, LIBOR is not a risk-free rate. It contains some credit and liquidity component. And as I said, uh, the new rate benchmarks are risk-free. So don't, they don't have that credit component. So what we need to do, we need to find essentially, we need to do essentially two things. We need to define um, a, a term rate, so a rate that spans uh, the given period, like three months or six months, and this rate should be based on the overnight rate. So we need to find a way of going from overnight to three months, and we, find, we need to find a way also of adding uh, some credit premium or credit or liquidity premium on, on top of this term rate we are building from the overnight rate. These are the two main things. So um, this happened already. Uh, so the, this happened like in uh, several steps. 
But effectively, um, I'm telling you also decisions that happen in the market. So the um, decision was to use uh, as a uh, term rate a daily compounded setting in arrears rate. So what you do, so if you have, say, a, a three-month period that starts today and ends in three months, what you do for the next three months, you take the daily observation of software as published by Fed, and you, you do this daily compounding from today until the end of the period, until three months. And then you pay this rate. The, the rate that will be set in three months is the rate that it is paid by the contract that you are considering. Um, not everybody uh, wanted to have this rate, but the main reason why this rate was chosen, it is because this is objective. This is objective and this is something that is transparent. The methodology is clear, so it cannot be manipulated. I, I forgot to tell you this. So when it comes to um, the software, the volume of software is, uh, you know, almost thousand times higher than that of LIBOR. So could even be as high as one trillion US dollars on a daily basis. That on, um, on LIBOR is usually below one billion dollars. So that's a comparison. That's why that overnight rate uh, was chosen to be the best benchmark because liquidity is so much higher than uh, the LIBOR and than any other uh, rate available in the market. So, but that rate is objective, is, uh, is almost impossible to be manipulated because of this high volume and, uh, you know, and because of this um, uh, weighted uh, uh, median uh, calculation. And uh, um, so how do you go from overnight to, uh, to a term rate? As I said, the best way was to do this daily compounding. And, but then you have also the problem of adding the spread. So there was another consultation that ISTA put together to decide how to calculate the spread. This was done, this has been decided, essentially, so the spread, so this uh, correction to add on top of this daily compounding software rate to match LIBOR has been chosen to be a five-year um, uh, weighted median of the spread between the historical basis between LIBOR and this daily compounding software rate. So um, the good news for Bloomberg is that Bloomberg is, will be the calculation agent. So it's the calculation agent. We're already publishing this, that number. So that spread hasn't been set yet. The methodology has been set, but the spread hasn't been set yet because okay, we are still kind of calculating. So we are still in this uh, historical phase where we are calculating uh, the spread between uh, LIBOR and daily compounding software rate. But bottom line is the following. So we are doing this as a fallback. Why? Because if you have a swap, and if you enter today a LIBOR-based swap, what are you getting if you're receiving LIBOR? What are you getting in two years if LIBOR disappears, right? So you are supposed to receive LIBOR to pay the fixed rate for 10 years, but LIBOR will disappear in a year or so. So what's going to happen to your contract? What are you going to receive? You are going to receive the new fallback. And the new fallback is this daily compounding software rate plus a fixed spread that will have to be set next year. So we don't know yet when, but at least we know how that spread will be calculated and Bloomberg will be the calculation agent for that. Next slide, please. So this is a, a graph showing you roughly an approximation for that spread. So as a proxy for that spread, I take the five-year um, uh, swap rates. So uh, LIBOR-based and, and uh, Fed fund-based ones. So I take you know, uh, two proxies, so basically. Uh, I take the swap rates as proxy for, um, uh, for the actual rates and, and I take like the uh, Fed fund as proxy for software because we, maybe we don't have liquid software swaps anyway. Um, so you see the, the, the spread um, uh, in, gray, in green um, in uh, the bottom graph and you see that it's being volatile. So roughly now we have like roughly 22 base points, whatever. So that's kind of average expected spread in the market that we expect to pay in, you know, uh, in future transactions. So this is kind of expected uh, um, uh, fallback spread that will be added. So um, um, still, there will be some variability because that spread has been fixed yet, but it will be roughly 20 base points, which means that 
you know, instead of receiving LIBOR, you will be receiving this daily compounding software rates plus 20 basis points. And that 20 basis points will be fixed, uh, you know, uh, when it is fixed, next year, sometime next year, uh, until the end of your contract. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, more or less already said that. So basically, um, so ISDA put together uh, consultations. The market came up with, uh, with uh, answers and not only on the way of calculating this term rate, so uh, which, was the, uh, which was decided to be this daily compounding software term rate, uh, but also about the, um, the spread. And so uh, it was, Bloomberg was chosen as calculation agent and there is a Bloomberg page you can access where you can get like, you know, uh, all the estimates for the fallbacks and, and so on. So, in case um, uh, you have a Bloomberg terminal, you can directly access um, that page to get all, all this information. But the bottom line is that um, you won't be receiving LIBOR anymore. You won't be paying LIBOR anymore. You will be paying uh, this fallback, um, uh, fallback, which is this daily compounding software rate plus this fixed basis. Next slide. So um, this is only fallback for swaps. And uh, uh, so you may uh, argue that, you know, we have many more financial contracts, what's gonna happen? So I mentioned my mortgage, what's gonna happen to my mortgage? And uh, so I would say that, uh, at least in the US, we are all, um, regulators are leaning towards using exactly the same fallback across different products for a simple reason, that all these products are connected to each other. So when you issue a floating rate note, for example, a floating rate note uh, needs to be hedged with a LIBOR swap. The new, uh, an old floating rate note needs to be um, uh, hedged with a LIBOR based swap. So that, okay, you are, your exposure is turned from like a, a based on a floating rate to be based on, on a, on a, on a, um, uh, on a uh, fixed rate. But uh, now you have like this uh, daily compounded software rate. So because I showed you that uh, since two years ago, French institutions started issuing um, uh, floating rate nodes based on software. What are we going to do with them? How do we hedge them? We hedge them with software-based swaps. And, uh, and now, uh, that's fine. Okay, this, this creates no inconsistency. But what happens, I mean, about uh, old floating rate nodes that depend on LIBOR? So maybe the floating rate nodes have a longer maturity that will expire in 2030, let's say. And those floating rate nodes are being currently hedged with uh, LIBOR-based swaps. Can you imagine if we have now a fallback on the LIBOR side, on the hedge side, that is different than fallback that on, the, on the cash instrument side? And this is a consideration that you know, regulators have to, and the, the working groups have to take into account. And despite the fact that a lot of market players wanted to have a fallback specifically for floating rate nodes, that is forward-looking. What do I mean by that? So um, uh, if um, uh, the fallback for LIBOR uh, is set at the end of the period, this means that that fallback is backward looking by construction. So um, what does it mean? It means that you have an, uh, you have an uh, application interval. So you have LIBOR today, that will be paid in three months. This is being replaced by this daily rate compounded for the next three months. And so you will know the value of the variable rate only in three months. And this variable rate will depend on all the overnight rates from for the past three months. And uh, um, so there is a fundamental difference between LIBOR and the fallback. LIBOR is known at the beginning of the period. The fallback is known at the end. LIBOR is forward-looking because it applies to an interval that starts today and ends in three months. The fallback is backward-looking because it applies to an interval that started three months ago and ends today. So that's a more fundamental difference. Some people in the market, especially buy side, don't like that. They don't like that because they say, I also want something that is forward-looking. So they were thinking about it and about like a, a forward-looking term rate. But the problem with that is that this would create uh, a mismatch between fallbacks. So you have a, your floating rate node that is hedged by a LIBOR-based swap. 
So if the four, two fallbacks don't match, now suddenly you have a fallback basis. You don't necessarily want that. You, you want also the, the hedge that you put in place to be valid going forward as well. And this is, a, as I said, this is a, um, uh, um, for, um, for USD. Um, different currencies made of different solutions. I know, for example, in, in Japan, um, uh, regulators didn't like the idea of having this daily compounded rate. They prefer to have like a forward-looking term rate. So really, it's a, every single jurisdiction may act differently. But I would say that the vast majority, the you know, consensus is actually leaning towards this daily compounded overnight rate because it is more likely to be IOS compliant. It's more likely to, be, to comply and to fulfill all the good features that a new benchmark needs to have. Next slide, please. So one important thing is to say, OK, um, and that's also my, well, my opinion, you know, and uh, uh, non cell effects are, are, are way in. So the, um, once you, um, OK, uh, uh, ISDA has no uh, power to uh, compel people to do something. So they have guidelines and they, they have um, contracts, right? So you, you have a ISDA, ISDA uh, um, uh, say, uh, contract, if you want, right? That you can use as a, um, or a master agreement. You can use as baseline for your uh, agreement with the kind of party, right? So, but you can amend it as well if you want. But uh, anyway, so um, cur current swaps are based on a 2006, 2006 um, uh, ISDA um, um, contract definition. And if you go there, you see that, okay, they say for an interest rate swap that pays LIBOR, if LIBOR is not published on a given day, you use this fallback. What is the fallback? Essentially, you say the calculation agent, so ICE, is going to call a couple of banks in London and uh, to ask for, for a quote, and they will take the average and they will submit this as a quote. Clearly, this is not sustainable. That's why we have to come up with some, some better idea than us making phone calls and so on, right? So, the, um, um, so we have a different fallback. Is the amending their fallback language? But there could be a kind of party that says, look, given that this is not mandatory, I decide not to adhere with the, to the new uh, fallback language. Why? Because I don't like LIBOR to be replaced by a risk-free rate plus a fixed spread. And there is a, this is a very simple case. So you are receiving LIBOR because you really want a rate that hedges your exposure in case of a financial crisis. We know that in case of financial crisis, LIBOR goes up, right? So you may want to have a rate that becomes higher and larger when there is a crisis. This fallback is not going to do that. Why? Because the OIS rate is going to be uh, not impacted by a crisis. It's going to be the same, even lower. A fixed spread is going to be fixed. So that's a fixed, fixed spread. So there is not going to be impacted. So some people may say, I don't want to receive something that doesn't react with the, with the, you know, with the crisis in the market. So because this is not a good hedge for me. So why should I sign the new ISTA contract? I don't sign it. That's where the tricky part comes because then, okay, you know, kind of party and the bank needs to like agree on some kind of compensation, whatever, right? Um, uh, but this is exactly, you know, one possible conversation needs to, needs to happen, right? So a bank or needs to go to the, the kind of party, so a financial institution needs to go to the kind of party and say, okay, look, um, we have some uh, deals in place that are uh, based on LIBOR. We need to do something about it. Do we need to sign a new lease agreement? Yes or no? If they, they sign, okay, that's good which means that, okay, the, the lab of fallback kicks in. If they don't sign, we need to understand what to do. So we need to essentially um, redefine the contract. So, okay, look, I don't want this. I want a slightly different contract, so you can repaper the contract. Or you simply, you know, terminate the position, you get some compensation for that, and so on. So, but there are important decisions to be made, and some decisions are not really easy to make because um, uh, there is an impact. What's this impact? The impact is what I, I write in, um, at the top of the slide. The impact could be in a lot of different things. So you have a portfolio, and this portfolio or net is set with a lot of LIBOR-based uh, contracts. You know, now LIBOR disappears and you have a fallback, if you want to accept the new uh, ESA definitions. So what's going to happen about that? 
suddenly you have different exposure. So you have different values for your contract, right? So you have different MPVs of your position. Um, you have different sensitivities because risks will be different. You have different um, uh, uh, scenarios for the future. So different exposure, so different XVA adjustments. You possibly have different uh, um, uh, initial margins for uh, OTC transactions. Uh, you can have also different uh, capital charges for uh, because you know uh, effectively uh, uh, a software is different than the LIBOR. So they, you know, the regulators may may say that okay, you know, the no right rate behave differently than LIBOR. So uh, also the corresponding um, uh, charges will, will be different. So you have like a bunch of like a risk um, uh, analysis that you need to make. And the impact will not just be on, on, uh, on the price. So there is no just economic value transfer because you are choosing um, a fallback over, over uh, LIBOR. There is also a lot of things happening. So basically sensitivities will be different. Um, um, exposures will be different. So there will be also impacting when it comes to uh, XB evaluation adjustments. Uh, initial margins could be different, and also uh, capital charges will be different. So a lot of differences that are happening. And somebody needs to calculate the differences, those differences, and we also need to uh, agree on with the kind of parties on what to do about valuations. That's gonna not gonna be easy, and this uh, this is already happening. Also, and a lot of conversations are happening, and they're not necessarily easy to to have because some people say, you know, the one necessarily to to transition away from uh, LIBOR. I was happy with LIBOR. Why do you propose that to me? And then, so um, kind of parties will have to, you know, to step in and convince this that we have no choice because if LIBOR disappears, we have no choice. We need to do something. But you know, there is a lot of negotiation, possibly also uh, litigation. So that's why a lot of lawyers are also involved in this kind of matters because they anticipate uh, a lot of litigations uh, happening because people don't agree on valuations. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh, some comments about life after LIBOR. So effectively, it's okay. You know, uh, LIBOR is due to uh, to be phased out end of next year. So um, there are a lot of questions. So we see that okay, I mentioned these uh, steps to um, uh, to that need to happen. So, but you know, for LIBOR to be phased out, you need to have some robust market that people can rely on, right? So we have a huge LIBOR-based market these days, right? So LIBOR per se as a rate is not very liquid because, okay, so we said like a retail on LIBOR on, uh, on, uh, on deposits, on uh, uh, commercial paper and so on is not really high. But the, um, uh, the derivatives market, the um, uh, floating rate in market, the cash market on LIBOR is extremely, is extremely large. So we need to make sure that when LIBOR disappears, when it's going to happen very soon, the market on the new benchmarks will be, you know, uh, liquid enough to allow for the transition. And hopefully next year, when we are getting closer and closer to the transition and to the death of LIBOR, you know, uh, we're going to see more and more liquidity on the um, risk-free rate uh, derivatives market. So some questions, for, for example, is that, okay, so uh, we, we don't have a, a cap market, a swap shop market that is liquid enough yet, right? So, well, but not even a swap market, I mentioned before, right? Because a swap, mar a swap market is uh, fundamental, essential for the creation of a reliable uh, software curve. And if you need to like a discount of, uh, future cash flows up to 30 years or even 50 years, you really need to have like, you know, liquid, software swaps that you know go as long as 50 years otherwise you're not really able to build a reliable software curve and people will have you know different assumptions that will discount differently essentially because there is no underlying market data that um, supports your uh, curve construction and your you know discount factors calculations um, so another question is really about uh, also some contracts that were naturally defined in the presence of LIBOR that is forward-looking and that, you know, if you use a backward-looking index, like this daily compounding software rate, can no longer be defined. So a full rate agreement, for example, that pays now, uh, based on a formula, and the rate that is fixed now, um, cannot be replaced by a rate 
that is known in three months because the payment has to occur now. So if I take the formula of the software of the sorry the flow rate agreement, so essentially uh, LIBOR times year fraction divided by one plus uh, year fraction times LIBOR, and I replace LIBOR with this daily compounding software plus uh, maybe uh, fixed basis spread, uh, I immediately see I have a problem. Why? Because that LIBOR is known now at the payment time, but that daily compounding software will be known in three months. How can I pay now something that will be known in three months? It's impossible, right? So what I will have to do, I will have to change the contract. So the uh, FRA, a court agreement that is uh, defined now, cannot be defined you know, using software. The same thing with the more complex uh, uh, exotic options like uh, callable uh, or, uh, you know, uh, range accrual. So range accrual, uh, you know, def uh, is based on uh, uh, fixing, fixing uh, LIBORs on a daily basis and checking if that LIBOR is within some range. So you need to, on a daily basis, say, okay, what is the LIBOR today? Let me see if it is uh, in this range. But which LIBOR? The LIBOR that starts today for the next three months. So uh, can you do the same for uh, software? No, because that rate will be known in three months. And yet, you know, you need to do the, the calculation today. So um, other, so exotic payoffs, more exotic than a foreign agreement, will have to be amended as well. But there is no consensus, but we don't know how to do that. So in general structure notes, um, uh, will have to be redefined based on the new uh, on the new rates. The other question is that will there be a zombie LIBOR? What is a zombie LIBOR? So zombie LIBOR is a LIBOR that keeps surviving uh, despite the fact that regulators are not requiring uh, contributions from banks. So basically, if the contribution is not mandatory, some banks may still uh, volunteer to submit LIBORs. Not all the banks in the panel, but some. Let's say the four or five banks and say, you know what, I still submit LIBOR. So the um, general perception is that if they're not um, compelled to submit LIBOR, they will not. So um, there seems to be no bank that is willing to, uh, to do something just on a voluntary basis if they don't have any incentive to do that. But there could be, for some reason that is not clear now, there could be banks that decided to um, uh, continue to submit LIBOR, maybe one, two, three banks. So, okay, see, we have contributions on a daily basis, so we can get this kind of zombie LIBOR, so LIBOR will continue to, um, to exist, but in a different form, because one thing is to have LIBOR based on 20 submissions, and other thing is to have LIBOR based on three, four submissions. Clearly, it's a different object. It's going to be much more volatile, less robust, and so on, right? And, and on top of that, if LIBOR was not IOSO compliant the way it was before, you can imagine it's going to be even less if you take less contributors, right? Um, there will be LIBOR proxies. So LIBOR proxies meaning like a risky indices, right? So the, uh, the new benchmarks are risk-free. As I mentioned before, some people may say, you know, I really want a rate that is risky. I don't want to have a risk-free rate. I want a rate that jumps up when there is a financial crisis. And this could be the case of Ameribor, for example, or Ameribor. I still don't know where to, you know, if I... Uh, I need to read it like America or like uh, LIBOR, right? So it's, uh, some people say Ameribor, some people say uh, Ameribor, who knows? But that doesn't matter, so you know what I'm talking about. So this is, this is an overnight rate, but it's effectively a rate that um, um, it has some kind of uh, credit spread. It's not really like software. It is uh, some credit spread because it is calculated like LIBOR, but instead of being like uh, uh, calculated by, you know, uh, submitted by, the top uh, banks in the financial system is being submitted by regional banks. So the, this great idea was actually, okay, there is a big market, uh, interbank, uh, interdealer market, but it's not between the top dealers, it's between like, uh, you know, uh, lower level, uh, lower tier dealers. So let, let's take the market because, you know, they, they, that market has a lot of information. So they, they, they came up with this uh, new index, um, uh, which is called Ameribor. There are other efforts also at Bloomberg we have an effort to build a credit, so-called credit index that um, uh, essentially will uh, define a spread of a risk-free rate. And this spread accounts you know, for uh, this uh, credit and liquidity component that we, uh, we discussed about. And some people may want to have it because they need, they need a kind of a, you know, rate that contains the, those kind of components as well. Um, cross-current swaps, I mean, like uh, cross-current swaps could be also problematic because 
there could be a mismatch between two legs, you know, and, uh, you know, one currency, the solution one currency could be there. Solution one, the other currency may not be there. There could be some mismatch and so on. So a lot of things that need to be defined and say, lot of emerging markets, people are also discussing and getting, um, getting like uh, ideas these days. And uh, um, so this is a really a situation that's been evolving, but there are a lot of things that needs to be done. And uh, I'm going to conclude with the next slide and before taking like, you know, a couple of questions, if uh, you have any. Um, so next slide, please. So I just conclude by listing um, some of the key challenges that an institution has to face. So this is what happens when you have like a, a level transition, right? Not only top banks, but also like, you know, uh, regional banks or, uh, you know, financial institutions in general, um, even, uh, even uh, big corporations, I mean, they, they may have similar issues. So, the, you know, you have ma many challenges. So the very first one that seems to be trivial, it is actually not. You need to um, identify all uh, IBOR-based uh, contracts that as a firm you own. That may be, uh, uh, sounds trivial, but you know, uh, you need to get, dig into your systems to make different systems, different repositories where you have this information. You need to dig and, you know, basically, you know, get an inventory of all possible contracts, all the foot rate notes, all the mortgages, all the, um, all the slow options, all the, the derivatives, whatever, right? that are um, referencing IBORs in different, uh, different currencies. And you need to, you know, to, need to know exactly what you have and you need to be aware of the fallback language because you know, some contracts may have like uh, an existing uh, fallback language, which is a bit uh, uh, weird. So you need to be aware of what you need to do about that. So uh, what you need to do also, and of course, uh, you know, uh, I would say that most organizations have already done that. You need to set up a work, internal working groups because this is not something that impacts, I don't know, the uh, um, uh, money market swap desk only or the fixed income swap de uh, fixed income desk in a bank, right? Uh, LIBOR transition has a global impact in the whole organization, not only in the, in the, in the global financial markets, but also like, you know, the, you know, the pure investment bank, right? So whenever they issue something, right? The, also, when they have like some structure finance, whatever, because there are loans, whatever, right? So more, the more traditional banking activities, right? So the uh, the more traditional banking activities. So uh, because it's based on loans, I mean, these loans will not be referencing LIBOR anymore. It will be referencing maybe software or something else. So we need to rethink about the business. There are impacts across the board. So you need to have working groups so that people um, give feedback and they discuss on the best way of moving forward. And, uh, and that's why you need to develop a, an effective governance because you need to set up maybe like uh, not only working groups, but you know, also new, uh, new teams. So you need to have like a different structure in your organization. Maybe with new leaders say, okay, you know, you have a, like a leader for um, this type of transition that really has some power and is enforcing decisions across different like uh, um, uh, organization in the industry, in the, in the, in the institution. And, uh, and then there are other decisions to take. Like, so basically you want to, um, to decide what to do in a specific situation, you want to take um, to build also um, uh, valuation tools. Um, uh, you need to assess valuation impacts. You need to implement those changes. You have to upgrade your systems. You need to uh, also communicate properly inter internally, but also externally because you need to reach out to your clients and say, "Okay, this is what's happening. It is what we are proposing because we have like a bunch of um, deals in place with you, and this is what we are proposing to move forward." So it's a really big, big, big endeavor, and that is also taking a lot of uh, like resources, a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, say finances, and, and uh, because really uh, banks are also um, um, uh, allocating uh, big budgets for labor transitions to pay for you know new people because that you have you know, maybe new people account you know taking care of that. You need also to have a uh, um, uh, consulting firm stepping in helping you with this. Uh, um, um, transition because they you know they they know how to maybe set up systems and also to the to um, um, uh, to communicate between different departments. Um, they, you know maybe you need to pay also for uh, system upgrades and so on, right and maybe new softwares, new hardware and so on. But this is a, and um, and basically also maybe only there is an impact on also your valuations when when banks switch from. Um, uh, uh, LIBOR discounting to 
um, Fed fund discounting, OIS discounting, uh, some bank had to like uh, post losses, millions and millions of dollars of losses because of that switch. And so sometimes okay, people need to also you know, be ready to, uh, um, to have losses based on that, you know, based on valuations they're making. So this, uh, this is a big thing. We don't have much time. Um, uh, the COVID crisis is also another big question mark. Uh, if we um, uh, are able to um, uh, comply with the timelines we had in mind, um, there, you know, regulators decided. I mean, said basically, there is no idea of postponing uh, uh, the deadlines. But the reality is that there is no official deadline yet. Nobody ever said, okay, you know, December thirty first next year is the official deadline uh, worldwide, right? So there is an intention that's extremely likely to happen that LIBOR will disappear, but is not one hundred percent sure. So it's uh, um, so that's there is still this little uncertainty that is driving the market, and also depending on uh, on the currency. For example, on uh, the eurozone, for uh, um, Euribor is not going to disappear next year. Euribor is is there to happen for the next few years because it was amended, and uh, and actually uh, it became IOS compliant because it is also based on transaction. There is uh, like a fallback logic inside Euribor definition. So. Um, uh, some other regions decide also to amend that, that IBOR in a way that was sustainable. And so your IBOR will be there. And uh, it's not going to happen like um, disappear like USD LIBOR anytime soon. So, um, um, so different uh, currencies are adopting different solutions. Um, uh, but it's important to understand exactly what's going to happen globally and the, the challenges. So. I, uh, I provided a lot of information. A lot of, um, um, a lot of information is based on facts. Some information I provided is mostly based on uh, um, ideas and opinions on things that need to happen. And I, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any question you may have uh, now. So uh, I stop here and I thank you for your attention. you managed to make complex issues crystal clear. Thanks a lot for helping us navigate this historic change in fixed income markets. Thanks a lot, and I wish you a very good morning back to New York. Para todos ustedes que permanecen con nosotros, recuerden que tendremos una mesa panel dedicada a este tema, el cambio histórico en los mercados de renta fija por los nuevos benchmarks en tasas de interés. Con Alejandro Faesi de Banorte, Gerardo García del Banco de México, Javier Alvarado de Bonex, Manuel Mesa de BBVA, moderados por Jorge Alegría del CIMI. Eh, les deseo una gran experiencia de educación y conocimiento en este, el segundo día de la Risk Management and Trading Conference. <música>